It's only the Conservative Party in the middle which is stuck with the difficulty of having to defend its own record on Brexit. Uh, Brexit in particular uh, uh, creates enemies for the Conservative Party on both sides. Um, those who, even among the Conservative voters, were never enthusiastic about the uh, about leaving the European Union, and those who are the the, the clientele of reform who who remain enthusiastic about Brexit um, but think that it hasn't been pursued with sufficient zeal. <laughs> Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking once again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about developments in the United Kingdom related to Brexit. Brendan, Brexit seems to be continuing its uh, chaotic impact upon the British party landscape, the latest development being the defection of Lee Anderson to reform from the Conservative Party. Is reform simply UKIP remade, or is it uh, rather more than that? It's slightly different from UKIP, because uh, UKIP was about getting the United Kingdom out of the European Union, um, and that's happened. And it's not merely happened, uh, it's proved an obvious disappointment, um, a failure, m many people would say. And this leaves the, the party, the Home Party, which in many ways is the successor of UKIP, with, with two, two challenges, uh, one of which is to find a, a reason, a, a narrative as to why Brexit is obviously failing, and second, perhaps to um, el elaborate um, one or two policies or attitudes uh, which go beyond Brexit, which are not incompatible with Brexit, but may broaden the appeal of the party. And what are these wider policies? Well, they're essentially about um, migration, uh, leaving the European Convention on Human Rights, and participating in what, what are called culture wars. Um, all of these th three things are, are, are natural concomitants of, of, of Brexit. Uh, the narrative about um, why Brexit has failed uh, is to say that those who've been charged with carrying it out uh, weren't sufficiently zealous and weren't sufficiently enthusiastic about it. Um, that's a, an attractive um, analysis because it can never be disproved. As far as migration and immigration is concerned, it's a paradoxical position uh, because it's become perfectly clear that the British economy needs a, a lot of um, migratory w workers. Um, and these were provided in many ways much more economically efficiently and co 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 conveniently um, by being in the European Union. So that's why um, questions of um, migrants coming uh, to seek refugee status over the channel, supposedly illegal migration, is at the centre of what um, reform talk about. Uh, they don't talk about the real question, which is, of course, relating to legal migration. As far as the Conservative Party reacting to this, Conservative Party is is really paralysed. It doesn't know how to react um, because uh, it knows that there are many of its members, many of its supporters in the newspapers um, who agree with um, uh, with the reform attitude. Um, but on the other hand, they know that um, there are dangers to what they call their their southern base to the southeast um, uh, of England constituencies around London um, who are put off by what, what they regard as uh, uh, an unattractive drifting towards the reform position, uh, not just on migration, but also on, on cultural issues. Uh, one of the other aspects of the reform uh, agenda um, is to participate very vigorously in what's called um, cultural um, wars. Uh, Lee Anderson, in particular, is a, a an enthusiastic cultural warrior um, on his television um, appearances. But what are these cultural wars precisely? Well, it's very vaguely defined, of course. It's the idea that um, uh, somehow um, the United Kingdom has been taken over um, by a, a metropolitan over-liberal elite who've lost touch with the, the real sense of common uh, values and decency um, of, of the United Kingdom populace. It's uh, an irony that um, reform claims to be in touch with the British people um, and then does so moderately in um, by-elections and any other electoral, part electoral exercise it's participated in. And this failure of Brexit, I mean, that doesn't seem to be damaging uh, the reform message, or, or 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 does it? 
Well, does it make it uh, 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 its threat actually rather exaggerated at the moment? That may be so, but the attraction of the reform message uh, is that it it puts the Conservative Party before a, a very difficult quandary. They can either continue pretending, which on the whole they do, um, that Brexit is working, um, or they can admit that Brexit isn't working and whose fault is it? It can only be theirs. And they don't seem to know what to do in, in choosing between those two, two extremes. Uh, funnily enough, um, the Labour Party seems to agree with an element of the reform message that Brexit could be made to work better. Uh, it's only the Conservative Party in the middle which is stuck with the difficulty of having to defend its own record on Brexit. Uh, Brexit in particular uh, uh, creates enemies for the Conservative Party on both sides. Um, those who even among the Conservative voters were never enthusiastic about the about leaving the European Union. And those who are the, the, the clientele of reform, who, who remain enthusiastic about Brexit, um, but think that it hasn't been pursued with sufficient zeal. But how effective do you think the reform challenge is likely to be if they get more defections from uh, the Conservative Party and, and therefore more MPs? I mean, are they going to become a, a credible challenge to the Conservatives? And, and are they going to be able to do a, a great deal of damage in the forthcoming general election? I think they're two separate questions. Uh, I don't myself think that there will be many MPs who peel off to join reform. Uh, I think that um, uh, Anderson was, was was an exception. I think that most of them will conclude that on balance, um, their future uh, political career is more likely to be sustained by remaining within the Conservative Party rather than going to reform. Uh, they know, they they remember that reform have got a rather moderate um, uh, record in um, the elections they've stood in so far. Um, and on the, uh, equally, UKIP um, flattered to deceive as far as electoral questions were concerned. So I, I don't think there'll be many MPs going to, to reform. Uh, on the other hand, I think that if reform do stand in the number of seats they're threatening to sit, stand in, um, many of which obviously are, are conservative, um, they may well change um, the conservative result from being a bad one to being a calamitous one. I think they are in a position to do damage to the conservative party. But part of this pressure of defections to reform is about whether or not to remove Sunak from the leadership of the Conservative Party ahead of a general election, isn't it? There, there is dissatisfaction with Sunak. But all the reports that, that, that I seem to read um, suggest that there's no coalition or coalescence around someone to, re re to replace him. Uh, the meeting last night between himself and the leader of the um, uh, of the 22 committee seems to have been a, a, an indecisive one. They don't seem to be the 50 plus uh, letters of censure going in that would trigger a leadership election. It, it may happen in May after the uh, local elections, that they'll be so catastrophic that the Conservative Party will do what I think it was Churchill said it, it only does in a crisis, which is panic. And there might be panic then. Um, but I think it will happen in, in a messy and, and confused way. I don't think that there is any coherent plot against him at the moment. But I think he's aware of the weakness of his position. And it's very well exemplified um, by the business of, of Frank Hester, where... Uh, Remarks were attributed to him, which could only be described as appallingly racist. And it took 24 hours for Sunak um, to, to say that, and to say that publicly, as he should have said at the beginning, because he knew that he was um, likely to offend some potential reform voters. Um, and that is something which uh, uh, he does, he thinks, at his peril. Well, the Hester case was obviously very extreme and very blatant. But uh, behind this is the broader issue of um, Islamist extremism, the accusation that, that, that this is a, a major danger to the British state um, and the pressures associated with that. And obviously the pressures which are also on the Labour Party are following the election of George Galloway. I mean, is there a danger that the Conservatives will be seeking in response to reform to weaponize uh, this uh, Islamicist uh, accusation and this theme, this divisive theme, 
um, and to encourage uh, a generally more divisive politics. Well, I think divisive politics have been all that the Conservative Party have had over, over the past um, five years since 2019. Um, as far as weaponizing anti-Islamic feeling is concerned, uh, I, I think there, there are limits to that tactic because uh, public opinion uh, on the Palestinian issue, the broad Palestinian issue, has changed in this country over the past 20 years. Uh, um, Islamophobia is something that um, may appeal to, to a certain fringe of the British electorate, um, but I don't think it's something which is going to be saleable by the Conservative Party um, to the middle range of British political opinion. One reason why conservatives, some conservatives, are um, relaxed about reform is that they feel that it is producing a, a new pole for protest that could distract from an, another party, which has traditionally been very much uh, one of protest, namely the Liberal Democrats. And one of the ironies of the Liberal Democrat position, particularly in the light of their strength in places like the southwest of England, was that whilst they were, this is before the referendum, uh, the most pro-European party in the UK, probably, um, they nevertheless relied tremendously, particularly in the West country, on people who in European elections voted for Brexit. And a lot of their vote was, was actually a protest one rather than one for their own political agenda, centrist political agenda. And if uh, reform continues to rise in the opinion polls, and it's now ahead of the Liberal Democrats on, on, uh, in, in many um, polls, uh, that this might actually blunt the Liberal Democrat attack in the blue wall, um, which is obviously another part of the mix going into the next general election. That may be true in some constituencies, but I doubt very much whether there'll be enough of such constituencies to to undermine what is going to be the the, the major result of the next general election, which will be a, a, a substantial Labour majority. What will happen afterwards, um, after the election, uh, I think is, is a, another interesting question. Uh, I can't see um, that the Conservative Party and Reform will survive after the election as two separate parties. Uh, I think uh, it's inevitable that there will be a merger between the two. Uh, and I can think, well imagine that Nigel Farage might be the leader um, of, this, um, of this merged party. It, it may be that um, one of the reasons why he's holding back from committing himself fully to uh, the general election campaign is, is that he wants to be able to emerge after the election as some sort of a unifying figure. It's a, a mind-expanding thought that Nigel Farage should be a un unifying figure, but stranger things have happened in politics. But one concern of that strategy, I mean, that's is certainly uh, one that is widely identified with Farage at the moment, is that if he waits until after the election, the Conservative defeat may be so substantial that what um, he inherits, bar some merger with reform, um, will be so far behind uh, in parliamentary terms that its ability to get back into government in, in one term um, will be impossible. Yes, that might be a, a calculation, but another part of the calculation would be um, that a, a wrecked and dispirited, demoralised Conservative Party can more easily be taken over. Uh, 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 as part of the background to his calculations must be uh, the volatility of British politics. Um, everybody said, not everybody, but many commentators said in 2019 that there was no chance, even if the Labour Party did well in the, next, in, in the years after 2019, of its being able to win an election, being able to win a majority in 2023 or 2024. Well, now all the speculation is only about what is going to be the, the magnitude of the majority. Um, those uh, hesitations of two or three years ago are completely gone. We live in a very volatile political situation um, and Farage and those who think like him may conclude that a, a totally shattered and demoralised Conservative Party can easily be taken over um, and then, and then um, as it rebuilds the Conservative Party, uh, perhaps building on the failures of the Labour Party in, in, in government, um, the two-party system, the first-past-the-post system uh, will work to their advantage. 
Well, the concomitant of that, of course, is that the Labour Party, uh, if it wins the election, will be inheriting an extremely difficult economic and geopolitical legacy, um, far more difficult than any facing uh, an incoming government for um, far more than a generation, indeed. And that, therefore, its chances of, of failing in office are, are actually very high. But... Perhaps we should conclude on, on wondering if you... Can I just make a point about that? That yeah. it may well uh, face difficulties, economic difficulties, um, but that does give it an opportunity to, to, to revisit the European issue, both in economic and political terms. Uh, I expect, obviously I hope, and perhaps the hope is farther to the thought, but I suspect that um, halfway in through the Labour um, Party's government from 2024, 2025, um, they will uh, attempt to develop a, a, a European nav narrative, which is both economic and political. Um, the political narrative perhaps is even more attractive than the economic narrative. It's that, uh, that the United Kingdom used to be uh, a rather normal, rather placid, rather, rather uh, happy um, European country. Since Brexit, um, society and politics have been torn apart. Um, if the return to the European Union could be presented, as I think it could easily be, um, by Starmer and the Labour Party as a return to normality, a return to European normality, then I think that's something that might well be attractive to many voters. If, um, as you believe, reform effectively takes over the Conservative Party after the next general election, where would this leave the uh, what's left of moderate conservatism, uh, old-style conservatism, pro-European conservatism, indeed. I mean, is that now completely destroyed? Would it seek to um, uh, rebuild the Liberal Democrats in a, in a more conservative direction? Or would it be reliant on the moves towards uh, a more European policy by the Labour Party and government along the lines that you've just laid out? Uh, all of the above is the answer to that. Um, it, the incapacity of what at one stage was a, a, a substantial wing of the Conservative Party, the pro-European wing of the Conservative Party, if you like, to act in a cohesive and coherent factor, uh, fashion has been one of the reasons why the Eurosceptics, the, the Europhobes, uh, found it so easy to take over the party. Uh, I, I, I doubt very much whether there will be any coherent response from the uh, fragmented and, and diminished um, group of, of pro-European conservatives you're talking about. It's possible, it's possible that they might try to find, to found some sort of regional party, perhaps a, a Southeastern party or a London and Southeastern party. Um, but uh, uh, I'm not holding my breath on that. Uh, I, I think the uh, the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats will both benefit from, from this fragmentation of the Conservative Party. Some Conservatives will just drop out of politics and there, there won't be a, a cohesive response from them. But this, of course, is a, a fundamental problem because it's very difficult to see us rejoining the EU unless there is broad uh, support for that right across the political spectrum. If it is simply a centre-left, agenda that makes the task much more difficult well i was talking more about um, people who've been politically active up till now uh, it, it doesn't follow at all uh, that that uh, centrist center right opinion in the country uh, couldn't move in a more pro european direction it's just that i'm doubting whether the the remnants of the conservative party will be able to lead them in that direction but will this require a, a new party creation or will it be the Liberal Democrats that become the con the new Conservatives in this sense? I, I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows. Um, but I find it difficult to believe that in five years time, uh, when centre right um, opinion within the country has moved decisively, as it's already moving, but in five years' time, we might move more decisively in a pro-European direction, that that won't find political expression. But what that political expression will be, I don't think anybody knows at the moment. Well, watch this space. This is obviously very um, central to our um, discussions and, and, and work. Uh, Brenda, many thanks for that. Um, I hope you enjoyed this discussion and we'll follow our other ones on the same topic. Thank you very much.